Warning. This episode is going full speed ahead into spoiler territory for the Magnus Archives. I'm talking about spoiling basically everything in the show here, so if you have any intention of listening to it, which you should if you haven't already, bookmark this page and book it out of here so you can enjoy the series in its true glory. Also, this episode is going to feature in-depth discussions of fear, in particular as they relate to the sky, the ocean, falling, and the existential dread that you are insignificant on a universal scale. As a result, viewer discretion is advised. Oh, and a massive thank you to the Magnus Archives wiki, which was very useful in getting the info for this video together. Hey y'all, I'm Afton G. here, and welcome back to Entities Explained, the series where I break down one of 15 eldritch fear gods each month from the hit horror anthology podcast, The Magnus Archives. This series has been going for almost a year now, so if you want to catch episodes 1 through 10, rather than starting here, there should be an iCard now in the top right corner of your screen linking to the full playlist. Anyways, subscribe if you don't want to be eaten by the sky, and buckle in, because it's time to take on the Vast. Also known as the Falling Titan, the Vast is one of two fears centered on scale. Specifically, the Vast is the fear of enormous objects and open areas. On the open areas front, this gives the Falling Titan dominion over the expanse of the sky, the void of space, and a degree of control over open water. As an extension of these themes, the Falling Titan is also given control over heights, falling, and vertigo, all feelings associated with the presence of too much space. Obviously, enormous scale is also a part of the vast, which can appear as giant figures or regular objects rendered infinite along with large funds or personal freedom. The most interesting manifestation of the Falling Titan in my mind would have to be its philosophical representation, specifically in how Vertigo represents feelings of insignificance and meaninglessness against a massive, uncaring universe. Actually, I didn't explain that, did I? In the early drafts of the Magnus Archives, an alternate name for the Vast was Vertigo, I can say that with absolute certainty now, thanks to the help of the people in the Statement Remains Discord server, who pointed me towards the Season 5 Q&As as a source for the original names. I checked them, and yeah, in Mag Season 5 Q&A Part 2, right around the 50 minute mark, they talk about the old names. It's all there, it's great, and I'm glad to finally have proper confirmation with a source and I didn't even wind up having to harass Johnny for it. As far as characters go, the Falling Titan is actually sort of lacking. Starting with everyone's favorite one episode appearing academic, we have Mike Crew, not to be confused with Michael Shelley, Michael the Distortion, or Mikhail Salesa. Mike Crew was struck by lightning as a child, leaving him with a Lichtenberg figure scar that attracted a creature of the spiral towards him. After spending years searching for a way to escape it, in the process testing out a variety of lightners, he eventually found Ex Altiora, which allowed him to trap the fractal creature. In the process, though, he devoted himself to Vertigo, which mostly seemed to mean he could banish people into an infinite sky dimension. Mike Crew would eventually meet his end purely by being in the wrong place at the wrong time, since while talking to walking bad luck charm Jonathan Sims, he was kidnapped and shot by Daisy Tonner, forever in our hearts, and somewhere in Epping Forest. The Fairchilds? Fair children? Fair folk? Simon and the Fairs? Whatever. The Fairchild group are a collection of vast avatars who have all chosen to take the name Fairchild. They're not a family, and really aren't related very much at all, but that's the direction they chose to go in. Unfortunately, we only know the names of two of them. The first, Harriet Fairchild, exists. She's one of them. But we all know why you're really here. Simon Fairchild. Simon Fairchild is an ancient follower of Vertigo, having gained his powers after falling off of a ladder somewhere in the 1500s, which he did while painting skies under Venetian artist Tintoretto. 
We don't know much after that, though, except for the fact that he was a con artist in the 30s who also robbed people, both of their belongings and their names. By the time of the early 2000s, Simon Fairchild was a shriveled old man who had accrued so much money that he could basically do whatever he wanted. He'd go skydiving, mountaineering, talk to lonely archival assistants, even help fund a space station, making sure to traumatize people every step of the way. Once the change had settled in, Simon found himself comfortably living in his own domain, where he and a giant person amalgam he called Junior terrorized the people both in his giant person blob and running around below trying to escape it. Unfortunately for Simon, all good things must come to an end, and even though the archivist couldn't catch him, the court of public opinion sure did. It's unclear what exactly happened to him besides people beating him up, but I like to imagine they threw the old man off of something quite tall. The only other significant character associated with the vast was Jan Kilbride, one of three, technically four but nobody counts the idiot in the box, crew members on board the Daedalus. While Manuela performed experimental crimes against nature, and Carter starved himself, Yen was told to do menial tasks around the ship, which all changed when his real purpose had been revealed. He had actually been sent up by the Fairchild crew, who were attempting to give him a fear of the Great Void. Judging by the presence of the giant shadow creature blocking out stars as it moved, I'd guess it worked. I'd also guess it worked, cause later, when Gertrude chops him up and tosses his bits into the pit to stop the sunken sky, it actually does something. Oh, also, there might be a cable car terrorizing beast? Or that might just be Simon Fairchild. I don't know. The vast collection of artifacts is rather interesting, in part because there's only two of them, but more so because they're both books, one of which is never even given a name. Known only for its strange effects, it was one of many tests conducted on Sarah Carpenter by fellow archival assistant Emma Harvey. Apparently the Book of Astronomy almost claimed her, and wound up leaving constellations in her eyes for a while after she tried to chart the stars, but we don't know much else about it. The Falling Titan's much more significant book is, of course, Ex Altiora, a Latin volume with a title that translates to From Higher, or From the Heights. The book apparently tells the story of the inhabitants of a village attempting to stop its destruction at the hands of an unfathomably large monster. Each time they would devise a plan, though, the being would get closer, revealing its size to be much greater than expected and their countermeasures entirely ineffective. In the end, the townsfolk are overcome by despair and hurl themselves off of a nearby cliff. All of this is detailed with striking woodcuts, which later include an image of a starless sky where the fractal beast has presumably been trapped. Speaking of which, this book has several other unique properties besides just sealing away monsters. One interesting tidbit is that it exudes the scent of ozone, though this might have something to do with the extension of the twisting deceit locked within its pages, since Herbert Knox only ever describes it as being attributed to the force that scares Mike away, despite having had ownership of the book for a good while. Its other power, quite fittingly for a manifestation of the vast, is to induce vertigo in its reader. As someone who gets really bad vertigo, please keep this book far, far away from me. You know, and the whole madness demon trapped within its pages thing. There aren't a whole lot of locations attributed to the vast pre-change, but I'll do my best with what's given. The sunken ship which appears in Mag-51 high pressure definitely has something to do with the falling titan. Even though its crushing weight at the bottom of the sea might seem more buried, the presence of Simon Fairchild and some giant creature in the depths definitely proves that the opposite power is also at play. The other major location with significance to Vertigo is something we'll be talking about for the third and final time today, the Daedalus. As explained earlier, Jan Kilbride was bundled onto a fancy space station called the Daedalus, mostly because Simon had money burning a hole in his pocket and wanted to make someone very unhappy. He spent a while up there, and by the time he got back, he'd been pretty changed by the scale of what he encountered up there. And then Gertrude chopped him up. Murder Grandma 1, Weird Fears of Scale 0. 
The Awful Deep is the only named vast ritual we know of, and it was, of course, orchestrated by Simon and the Fairchilds, although I suppose this was before they were the Fairchilds and he was Simon. The main idea was to try taking advantage of the aquarium mania by constructing a giant diving bell in 1853, with a little help from notable dark avatar Edmund Halley, and somehow use that to generate fear. Unfortunately for Simon, the fear just wasn't there, and with a little hunt intervention, he and all of his sacrifices were sent plummeting to the depths of the ocean. Honestly, that idea might have worked better for a ritual. He should consider bringing that hunter in as counsel on the next one, if there's any chance they're still alive. Speaking of the next one, Simon did have a plan for what he wanted to do. He didn't get too specific with it, but he seemed dead set on space. Too bad he never got around to that while he had magic powers, huh? While most entities don't appear very much in the post-change world, the domains category is finally an area where Vertigo can shine. One of the issues with assigning the vast to any of these is that so many of the domains are massive, so you could argue that by sheer scale alone, almost all of them feed into the falling titan in some way, but that seems wrong, so I'll just talk about the ones which carry its themes. The Great Beast, of course, Simon Fairchild's domain, where a number of small towns in a large open area are being attacked by a giant monster, probably falls into that category. Not all of the victims in this domain are on the ground, though. Some are unfortunate enough to have found themselves as a part of the giant human amalgam terrorizing the town, being just one minor piece of a truly massive creature. The monument definitely feels like it should be eye or spiral aligned, but there is some argument to be made that it belongs to the vast. Next up is the ocean, an absolutely awful domain where people are left to drown while some great beast swims around them. Once the person finally manages to break through the surface of the water, they come to the horrifying realization that the ocean goes on forever and there is no hope of escape, leaving them to simply sink back into the depths. Finally, there's the precipice. It's just a big ladder with people falling all around you. Not all of them have to be complicated to be effective. As we reach the end of this series, there are very few connections that haven't been explored yet, but between this and the next episode we'll finally be able to get into what is both one of the most clear-cut and fascinating dichotomies in the entire show, the buried against the vast. Obviously just from a conceptual level, the fear of large spaces and the fear of small spaces should probably be opposites, but it goes a lot deeper than that. The Falling Titan and Forever Deep Below Creation are antithetical, to the point where neither could exist without the other, as they seem to define each other, but they also cannot operate normally when connected. If nothing else, the brutal death of Jan Kilbride and the tossing of his body into the pit should prove that point. However, it seems that they can, in certain very specific cases, commingle, such as in the sunken ship, or to a lesser degree in the ant tunnels. It's possible that these are the center points, areas where both have some level of dominion and, as a result, mostly manage to cancel each other out, but we'll likely never know. Another way that Close and Vertigo act as foils is in their symbolic representations, and in particular, with their relationships to wealth. Something I glossed over while explaining the symbols of the vast was its connection to wealth and freedom, which I'll bring back in here. Looking at the avatars of the vast, we have the Fairchild family, who have access to a near-infinite amount of funds, Simon, who seems to spend his days gallivanting about without a care in the world, Mike Crew, who can easily cover his expensive book-buying habit, and even Jan Kilbride, who was successful enough to find himself in space. Compare this to the victims, and very few, avatars of the buried, where we find people who don't nearly have the same access to funding, and it's pretty clear how opposites can once again come into play. Moving on from the buried, since we'll have plenty of time to talk about that later, the vast is also quite similar to the lonely, as is made clear by Simon's willingness to help Peter, and the idea of solitude making even a small room seem big. 
Another direct connection we get from the series is to the eye, where the idea of knowledge of scale being significant to the fear produced by the vast is brought up. Finally, the end, the flesh, and the corruption all share Vertigo's existential themes, specifically as they relate to the insignificance of the self. In the corruption, it's the individual's voice being drowned out by the hive. In the flesh, it's the fear of being nothing more than electrified meat, and in the end, well, it's pretty easy to feel insignificant when faced with your own mortality. Finally, it's time for us to really analyze the vast. Before we can, though, I have to feed into what has at this point been an almost year-long tradition and figure out some way the falling titan fits into storytelling. If I had to pick, I'd probably say that the vast is symbolic of, uh, rising and falling action. Because they go up, and they go down. Yeah, if it isn't blatantly obvious by now, this metaphor has run well past its course, but there are only three more of these to do, so I'm seeing it through to its conclusion. Now, on to the actually interesting stuff. First off, I want to talk about the theme of wealth in the vast. As mentioned in Connections, Vertigo is very tied to money, which sort of makes sense. First of all, most things that would cause acrophobia or agoraphobia often require at least some amount of money to do. Large rooms are associated with wealth and glamour. Mountaineering requires a decent financial investment and the ability to take a lot of time off of work. And even something as simple as flying on an airplane is a luxury not everyone has available to them. As the amount of money a person has grows, their options grow as well. So to truly have the open, nigh-infinite possibilities the vast desires, there must be a decent upfront cost. The Falling Titan also seems to focus almost exclusively on the future and the frontiers of technology, which are most often available first to those with the wealth to fund things like giant diving bells or space stations. I also want to talk about the many facets of the vast, because I find its role as an entity with many different pieces that all fit nicely together very interesting. The depths of the ocean, the expanse of the sky, and the final frontier of space are all very different, but I think Johnny hit it spot on when he chose to group these ideas together, because they all definitely create the same feeling of awe and terror. I don't know if it's just my personal history with large bodies of water, but there's something almost hypnotic about seeing the great emptiness of the ocean, knowing that you could just disappear deep within it and never re-emerge. The sky is much the same. It's nearly sickening to look out over the clouds and recognize just how small and far away everything is. I have not experienced space travel, nor do I expect that I will ever get the chance, but from the images I've seen, I don't think it's a stretch to say that a similar feeling would apply. I also think that feeling is a big part of why giant creatures work to scare us. I've been in the presence of very tall buildings, and I admit that there is something stomach-turning about just looking up at them, but I think the terror would be compounded upon seeing a creature that large. Now, multiply in the sense of scale, a near-infinite sky on a flat plane, and a tiny pink skeleton of a man, and I'd say we've got a pretty good recipe for some intense megalophobia. Well, there we go. I've finally done the vast episode of Entities Explained. There's not a lot of this series left for me to do, but hey, there'll be more videos once it's done. I know I say this every time, but I really am grateful that y'all have stuck around this long to listen to me ramble about a series I find interesting. I keep all of my Entities Explained stuff in one Google Doc, and right now it's sitting at a cool 62 pages long, single-spaced, which is quite a lot. Anyways, as always, be sure to let me know if I missed anything, if you have any theories of your own, if you disagree with my takes, or if you just want to say hi, all of which you can do in the comments down below. Oh, also, if you made it this far, there should be a link in the comments leading to a post about TMA Hot Takes. Feel free to leave any you might have there so I can review them for a future video. With all of this out of the way, prepare your flashlights and hold on to your ribs, because next time we're talking about Too Close I Cannot Breathe. Thank you once again for watching the video, I've been Afton G. Keir, and this has been Entities Explained. Good night, YouTube people.